Members, uh, the sitting is resumed and it's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. And just before we move to questions, question number one has been withdrawn, as has topical number four. Both of those withdrawn. So I call Claire Sugden. Deputy Speaker, question number two. And I call the Minister for the Economy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member uh, for her question. Um, in today's uncertain times, this is uh, a very important question for us um, as a Legislative Assembly to consider. My department provides a range of support to young people who are not in employment, education or training, often referred to as NEET. My department administers the Northern Ireland uh, European Social Fund programme which includes 18 NEAT projects with a value of over uh, $33 million. These projects are specifically designed to support young people. And examples of these projects um, are very wide-ranging um, across many uh, parts of Northern Ireland. So we have uh, Bryson House uh, Charitable Group, Extern, GEMS, Include Youth, Job Direction, the South West College, Springboard, Stepping Stones NI, the Princess Trust, um, Training for Women um, and Youth Action Northern Ireland. So it's really a very wide range um, of programmes that are supported uh, through this particular uh, part of the department. The Department for the Economy is also the Northern Ireland Accountable Department for Peace for Youth. This aims to engage 7,400 young people who are disadvantaged, marginalised and not readily engaging with other programmes. DfE Career Service provides all age, all ability careers guidance with a priority focus on helping those vulnerable to social exclusion. Inevitably, the response to COVID-19 and the lockdown in particular has made it more difficult to deliver these vital services. However, these services and projects have adapted to continue to provide much needed support throughout the crisis. In March 2020, Peace for Youth Project swiftly moved to online delivery to continue to support young people. ESF projects also moved to remote working. Some are now back working in their usual premises where social distancing allows. Since March, the Career Service has made over 49,000 contacts with 16 to 18 year olds to guide them in taking the next steps in their training, education or employment. Uh, Irem, Sir John O'Dowd, for your case, I call John O'Dowd. Do you want to call Claire for something, Madam? Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's response. In her response, she talked of the European Social Fund. I've been contacted by a number of community and voluntary groups who are quite concerned about the future of that particular fund. Will her department, um, if, if it is likely that that fund will no longer have a future, will her department fund that uh, shortfall if it becomes an issue? Again, can I thank the member uh, for her question. This is indeed a, a very important and, again, topical and timely um, question on this particular issue. Um, the European Social Fund funds a range of programmes, not just for young people who are not in employment or training, but also uh, part of the Northern Ireland Apprenticeship uh -huh. Programme. And therefore, it is very, very important to us um, that the executive collectively engage with uh, the UK government to ensure that our national government understand that in the replacement for that European Social Fund, the Shared Prosperity Fund, that Northern Ireland is not at a disadvantage, that Northern Ireland gains the same amount of funding from that Shared Prosperity Funding as it would do from uh, structural funds as they uh, come to Northern Ireland. And importantly as well, um, that um, we are able to set our own priorities and objectives for that funding as a devolved legislature with responsibility devolved in those particular areas. I um, am not, the lead department for this is actually the Department for Finance um, that has been working on this and of course I will continue to liaise with them and other departments uh, in London to make sure that these views are known Current ESF funding is secure until the 31st of March 2022. 
The Minister will be aware that since 2007, despite increased investment in Invest NA, they have actually created less jobs year on year since then. Would the Minister not agree with me that we need to hold what we have at the moment and that there should be increased investment in apprenticeships, uh, youth services and also for our students so that we create a future for those young people who have been so badly affected by COVID-19? I uh, thank again the member for the question. Again, uh, very important. Um, from my actions in as Minister for the Economy, um, I think this House will agree that we have invested significantly uh, in apprenticeships, in youth training, um, and in the skills agenda in Northern Ireland. That's not just important about holding what we have, that's important about developing the economy of the future and the skills pipeline that goes into that economy uh, of the future. And that is a, a very important aspect. And, um, you know, the, the department has been very um, proactive in not just looking at um, apprenticeships, but looking at uh, careers delivery and looking at other uh, short-term interventions which will help to build the Northern Ireland economy and build skills and engage our young people um, into the future. I just want to maybe just focus just for a second on, on one of those programmes which has been very, very important. The Assured Skills Academies that we have run. And these have been very, very successful in delivering um, um, properly trained young people, but also jobs um, for young people in difficult uh, circumstances. Um, and I, I'll refer to the Microsoft Cybersecurity Academy, which completed in Northern Ireland on the 12th of June, was delivered at the height of lockdown, and um, which um, was delivered completely online. 24 young people engaged in that Skills Academy and 23 young people find employment out of that Skills Academy. So long-term programmes on skills, but also that ability to be flexible and to match skills to labour market demand is really, really important. I, I know, uh, with your indulgence, Mr Speaker, I'll just maybe um, ask, uh, answer the other part uh, of uh, the member's question. It is really important that while we build our own skills base, that while we support companies here in Northern Ireland, that we also recognise the importance of foreign direct investment into Northern Ireland. And since um, April, I have announced um, over a thousand new jobs, even in the midst of incredibly difficult economic circumstances. Um, in uh, Northern Ireland. 600 of those new jobs have been announced from um, um, North American US uh, companies. And that shows us the importance um, of those uh, companies in investing in Northern Ireland. And I'm looking forward tomorrow to talking to the Special Envoy for Northern Ireland and building the relationships that allows that skills and that, those job pipelines to continue. I would just remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. If she requires additional time, perhaps she could ask just before you answer. Please, Minister. Thank you. Um, I call Cara Hunter. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Can I ask the Minister, are you engaging uh, with the Department for Education in order to deliver an effective uh, strategy to deal with our young people leaving school with low qualification, qualifications and at threat of unemployment? Again, can I thank the member for her question? Um, before um, this assembly um, collapsed in, in, uh, in earlier times, um, the Minister for Education and the Minister for the Economy were working together um, on a 14 to 19 year old strategy, really trying to look at the pathways that young people will take um, around that age, the choices they will make, and how we can improve services towards uh, those young people. Um, very early on, before the impact of COVID uh, in this uh, particular mandate, um, I have uh, been talking to uh, the Department of Education around this particular issue. Um, we have now re-engaged uh, with that uh, work stream, and I would like, in conjunction with the Department of Education, to bring forward a strategy that allows young people at 14 to 19 
not just to always look at traditional paths, but to look at alternative paths uh, towards their career prospects, um, and that we will help you all of our young people in progressing uh, those career prospects. We are talking also about creating that digital spine for Northern Ireland, so that we will be um, trying to incorporate those kind of skills for our young people right from primary school until they leave education, preparing them for the world of work and the economy of the future. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister has just announced a scheme in England for adults without an A-level or equivalent qualification where they will have access to a fully funded college course with an emphasis on, quote, skills valued by employers. Can the Minister assure adults in a similar position in this jurisdiction they will not be disadvantaged? I am um, extremely um, concerned uh, about the number um, of people uh, within the workforce, around 20%, who have no skills uh, or no, no formal qualifications. And this is an issue that I think that in the long term, the Assembly um, and the Executive will have to address. In uh, the short term, we have been working um, already with adults um, and with everyone really um, in, uh, who have been impacted um, by the impact of COVID uh, on uh, their employment. And the, our skills strategy division have been able to support 2,000 individuals impacted by uh, COVID-19, helping them to achieve one of over 90 online fully accredited qualifications in key areas, including digital, leadership, management, and employability. A second phase of this programme uh, will complete by March 2021, and we hope that it will support a further 3,000 individuals, including those who have been furloughed, made redundant, or who are availing of the self-employment scheme. And this will include collaborative approaches from further education around placement, um, and it's also supporting women uh, to return and get training in information technology. These are work that the department is already engaged in uh, and fully cognizant of. Paul Stuart Dixon. Minister, Minister um, will you uh, recognise the despair of my constituents whenever you've just recently told this House in, in a previous answer that um, you hope that the UK government understands the value of UK funds that have been distributed in, the, in Northern Ireland. Surely you and your party would not have dragged us out of the EU if you're only conducting those negotiations with the UK government now. Um, I shall resist um, for this once um, the, the, the Brexit uh, issues to focus on what I think are the really, really important issues going forward of skills in the Northern Ireland economy. And I have been proactively engaging with uh, my counterparts in London around the issues of the European Social Fund and its replacement in the Shared Prosperity Fund. I will further be supporting the Finance Minister as he seeks for a full replacement of those funds um, for uh, Northern Ireland. It is absolutely important that we are able to progress these issues for the people of Northern Ireland, for the young people of Northern Ireland, and particularly for the economy of the future of Northern Ireland. Iram Sir Trevor Lund, for Hanya Kesht, I call Trevor Lund. Gormer Agat, last come call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three, Minister. Can I thank uh, the member for his question? During my time as the Minister for the Economy, I continue to work with our national government to ensure that UK international trade policy works for the people of Northern Ireland. It has been my priority that Northern Ireland will be able to access both transitioned EU trade deals and new UK trade agreements. I have had extensive engagement with the Minister for State for International Trade within the Department of International Trade, both through the Ministerial Forum for Trade and via bilateral meetings on matters of interest to Northern Ireland. I have sought assurances that Northern Ireland will be covered fully in the scope of trade agreements. 
that our industry will be protected from unfair practices and that our businesses can remain competitive both in the UK internal market and globally despite the complexities of the protocol. From that perspective, it is critical to recognise that Great Britain is our most important market, accounting for almost £24 billion of trade in 2018. During the same period, trade with the EU, including the Republic of Ireland, amounted to £12.1 billion, and trade with the rest of the world to £6.9 billion. In other words, we did more trade in the GB market than we did with all of the other markets all added together. Um, so it is very important that when we are looking at international trade, we are also protecting our trade with our own internal EU, our UK market. In tandem, I've been encouraging the government to pursue with vigour a comprehensive trade agreement with the European Union. I support the government's ambition to have an agreement which supports our trade with Europe and through supply chain activity, our trade via Europe that goes into international markets. Case to Trevor Lunn. Uh, supplementary question, Trevor Lunn. Yes, I thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer. The, the, the figures for the, uh, trade with the European Union and the rest of the world are still very significant, Minister, and we may need them even more when this thing is settled. But given the British government's success in trashing our international reputation and the explicit statements from the United States, particularly from Mr Mulvaney just yesterday, about the consequences of interference with the Good Friday Agreement. What, 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 how does the Minister assess the potential, for example, with the trading agreement with America, or for a trading agreement? Um, can I first of all um, say uh, to the member um, that it is vast, vitally important that one, that Northern Ireland is able to trade within UK trade agreements on an equal basis to every other part uh, of the United Kingdom. That, of course, is complicated by the protocol. And I fail to understand why many parties in this House rush headlong to demand a full implementation, no less, of a protocol that would potentially restrict trade within the UK's internal market. And therefore, while trade with the rest of the world, including the European Union and the Republic of Ireland, is vitally important, and I don't underestimate it or diminish it in any sense at all, it is of utter importance to Northern Ireland that trade within the UK's internal market is able to continue unencumbered um, by um, restrictions imposed by the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think that's um, massively, massively important. It's also um, extremely important um, that we are able to trade um, with other international markets. Trade with, um, in the current um, EU uh, free trade agreements um, that have been rolled over and, and are, are, is worth 110 billion to the UK. Um, and still we have some outstanding trade agreements with the EU that are of very important significance to Northern Ireland that has still not been renegotiated by the government. And they include Canada, Mexico, Turkey and uh, Norway. Canada is our second largest rest of the world trading partner with a, an estimated £632 million pounds worth of trade in 2019. In terms of uh, the US trade deal, again, America is an extremely important uh, market for Northern Ireland companies. And the fourth negotiation on uh, the US trade deal took place between the 8th and the 18th of September. Um, and uh, Minister, sorry to interrupt, but we've overshot by quite a bit there. I thought you were finished I, with that. Could I give just two more stats, which I think are very important? Just very briefly, with please. permission, Mr Speaker. Um, again, trade with Australia um, began again the negotiation on the 22nd of September, and we are looking forward to trade negotiations with uh, New Zealand on the 19th of October. I call Gordon Dunn for. Thank the Minister for answers and indeed her efforts 
working with business through the, the COVID crisis to date. Invest and I have an important role for the support of businesses in Northern Ireland, those existing businesses through this terrible crisis. Can you also give us um, some indication of what other support is available from Invest and I, and indeed from the Department of Economy, to help our struggling businesses uh, ex exist and to come through this ongoing crisis? Again, can I thank the member um, for um, his um, question. Um, over the course of this pandemic, my department has administered over 400 million um, um, in uh, grant schemes um, and help uh, to well over 30,000 businesses in Northern Ireland. These have not been perfect, nor have they been, um, are, are we able to say that they have covered the full scope um, of the business spectrum. However, they have been exceptionally important in sustaining businesses and skills in a very, very difficult uh, time. If we uh, continue on the Brexit theme uh, that uh, the question started with, Invest and I are, are currently um, offering uh, Brexit preparation grants. And I'm very um, glad that the member has raised this particular issue with me because um, we need uh, to get the message out to um, businesses in Northern Ireland that this is available, that there is a full toolkit of resources available within InvestNI to help businesses prepare for the end of the transition period. Intertrade Ireland also have a significant level um, of interventions in place, and I would encourage um, us as members of this Legislative Assembly um, to convey these messages to businesses within our constituency so that they can get the help that they need um, in uh, the circumstances we find ourselves. I call Rachel Woods first. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, um, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, can the Minister outline if her or her department contributed to any response from the Northern Ireland Executive to the UK Government's internal market white paper consultation in June, especially with relation to future trading relationships and the NI Protocol? We continue um, to engage with um, our, our partners in government um, and responded uh, to the white paper. Um, and it is absolutely vitally important that while there are many views across this House on the issues of the Internal Market Bill, and I suspect they would not all accord with my view, I think there are some principles that we need to acknowledge and accept as being vitally important for Northern Ireland. The Internal Market Bill looks at the issue of unfettered access in um, the situation where there is uh, no deal and where the EU refused to um, acknowledge uh, the GB as a third country. I believe that it is absolutely vital that Northern Ireland firms have that unfettered access to the GB market. And while I'm on my feet talking about this particular issue, there are other issues that I think are of equal importance um, in relation uh, to um, access to our markets. So we need our government to tell us um, how they're going in conjunction with the, the Joint Committee to define goods at risk, because that will be important in getting those goods from our largest market in GB into Northern Ireland. We also need, as a matter of, of haste um, and great importance and urgency, um, the issue um, of um, a Northern Ireland qualifying good being uh, resolved. The Northern Ireland qualifying good and some of the issues around that would stop others using the route via the Republic of Ireland as a backdoor into the GB market and therefore impacting a Northern Ireland firm's competitiveness within that market. There are many issues that are to be resolved. We could talk about state aid and the fact that Northern Ireland would be encumbered with EU state aid regulations, while uh, the rest of the United Kingdom would be free uh, to make more generous uh, subsidies available towards businesses if it were so inclined. I want Northern Ireland to succeed, uh, and I want its economy to succeed.
Question four, please. Can I thank the member um, for her question? EU funding contributes uh, to increasing the skills base of those currently in employment and future potential participants um, and part funds DfE apprenticeship programmes. My department currently receives 10.4 million per annum from the ESF to fund our apprenticeship NI and higher level apprenticeship programmes. Any funding loss will restrict our ability to recruit new apprentices or fully see the upskilling of, these, of existing apprentices on these programmes. In order to maintain the scale of these programmes, the short funding, shortfall in funding will need to be sourced and funded. This is currently being considered as part of my department's succession planning for provision post-EU exit. The Department of Finance is leading the case for full replacement of EU funding in Northern Ireland, given the amount of funding that historically came to my department for economic development, energy, skills and apprenticeships, the department has been liaising closely with both finance and relevant Westminster ministers to ensure that our needs and priorities are reflected in these negotiations. Catherine Kelly, supplementary question for Catherine Kelly. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, Minister, you recently made a bid for £22.6 million so that the European Social Fund money could continue to be provided from April 22 to March 23. You'll be aware of how important this ESF funding is in tackling youth unemployment. With considerable numbers of young people now being made redundant, do you accept that the loss of European funding will have a detrimental impact, particularly with the loss of the European Social Fund on support for young people? While it's important to acknowledge that the European Social Fund um, has done significant and some very good work um, in Northern Ireland around um, the subject we were talking about earlier, those young people who are not in employment and not in training, um, and uh, in funding apprenticeships, we are currently engaged uh, in negotiations with our national government around the replacement for that funding, which is the Shared Prosperity Fund. And uh, the parameters which um, the Finance Minister has set for that is that we should receive the same amount of funding from the Shared Prosperity Fund as we currently do from the European Social Fund. And with that, we are at common cause with our colleagues in England, or in Scotland and Wales. Um, I also would like to see, um, after we have uh, established broad frameworks for that shared prosperity fund, that the detail of that fund should be actually administered and directed and guided by the needs of Northern Ireland and by this assembly um, in exercising its functions under the devolved uh, administration solutions. Okay, uh, very briefly, quick question from Pat Catney, I'm sure Pat Catney, if we could have a quick Thank answer you. to you, please. Deputy Chair. Minister, uh, every job's vital. We all know that. This House is aware of that. And those that go out and take the risks in order to start the business are the risk takers. But on top of that, we do need training. And I want the Minister on a quick question. It's a yes or a no. Can you tell me, Minister, um, th that has the Minister communicated these updates um, with the regional colleges are aware of businesses who have taken part in the scheme and how are able on additional apprenticeships uh, for the students so as they can find that employment. So, to the regional colleges, you're aware of the uptake on the apprenticeship. I did say a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> can I thank the, the Minister um, for, or the, the member for his question? Um, yes, um, I am in constant communication with all of our further education colleges um, and I will continue uh, to monitor. The scheme will commence in November as furlough ends. Um, for uh, young apprentices. We are encouraging employers to bring back young apprentices um, and to retain them right through to the completion um, of uh, their, their uh, apprenticeship. We are also offering funding uh, for those uh, employers who want to create 
new apprenticeships. And of course, this week I launched the Apprenticeship Challenge Fund for Northern Ireland. The work of the further education colleges will be absolutely vital in doing this. And I will continue to monitor, after the scheme is formally launched in November, I will continue to monitor the progress of the scheme so that we can ensure that employers, uh, businesses and the colleges are able to work together. Thank you, Minister. Uh, that concludes the period for listed questions, and we now move to topical questions. I guess here I'm sorry, Lors Kelly, for your case, I called Lors Kelly for a uh, question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, when will this Assembly have sight of a substantive economic recovery plan with built-in resilience for the new normal and with uh, outcomes and targets clearly measurable? Can I thank the member uh, for her question? The member will be aware that in June of this year I published um, my short and medium term plan for recovery, building a stronger economy. That not only looked at the short term issues that we would have to address, but also those medium term issues that we would need to address. But it also gives something of a vision for the future um, of uh, the Northern Ireland economy, the economy that I want to see take Northern Ireland into its second century. And that is looking at the new opportunities, at the sectors that we can do well in, those the digital sector, cybersecurity, areas where we are already a world leader, um, and grabbing those opportunities for the new economy for Northern Ireland, as well as supporting our traditional uh, firms, our traditional manufacturing base, and the values that we all hold very, very dear uh, for the Northern Ireland economy. That has been adopted as part of the um, executive's recovery strategy and in the meantime um, I and my department are working um, on a, an econ a, a strategy for the economy uh, which we hope will be ready in due course. Can I emphasize I'm not waiting for a strategy. I'm also taking the steps that need to be taken to help the Northern Ireland economy in unprecedented circumstances. Okay, Thank you, Minister. Minister, I just wonder, in terms of the new working normal, if you like, about uh, the opportunities for individuals, for businesses, for firms to access agencies such as Invest NI to discuss those issues. So I just wonder what plans you have in terms of easy access, easy business, and what role do you think councils might play in that? Again, um, I don't know whether the, the, the member has seen uh, my, my mailbox recently, but um, as a, a member for Upper Ban, uh, as opposed to Economy Minister, um, I have agreed to meet uh, the local economic development agency of uh, ABC Council, and I look forward uh, to that meeting. I intend to bring representatives of Invest NI to that meeting to make sure um, that um, the information is readily available and to make the links that we need to make between uh, government agencies or arm's length agencies of the department and local councils. Can I also say that I continue to work with local councils on the city deal strategy for Northern Ireland and I think that that as part of our medium to long term recovery is a very exciting mechanism to introduce new and innovative ideas. We have 500 million of new funding for innovation in Northern Ireland. That's a significant amount for the Northern Ireland economy. And we now need to progress the city deals as part of that strategy. And of course, again, as a local member, I will be discussing that with the council. I call Paul Given. The Minister will know about the incidences uh, at our universities where students now, some are having to uh, self-isolate because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, can the Minister provide an update of conversations that she's been having with our universities as to how these issues are being addressed and the students supported? Can I thank the Member uh, for the question? This is very important and, and very, very timely. Um, because I believe that our student population needs um, to have a clear message uh, and that we do need to support students um, in uh, the circumstances they find themselves. I understand that uh, representatives from the universities met with the executive office officials this morning um, and I, of course, spoke uh, to the universities this morning. 
Um, I also, later on this week, will speak with student leaders um, to uh, take their views. And I would like to see that we have a more holistic approach um, to uh, the, the, this particular issue. Um, again, I would also appeal to our student population. And I remember and remember that the vast and overwhelming bulk of our young people and students will be respectful of the regulations, respectful of each other, but I would ask them to respect the regulations, to, you know, good hand hygiene, social distancing, to wear the mask, obey the rules around campus so that they can keep themselves, their friends and their families safe. Paul Given for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that response and commend her for the work that she is doing uh, and engaging with the universities. In, in that engagement with the universities, um, can, can she continue to uh, get assurances from those that are running our universities that everything possible is being done to maximise the opportunity for our students to learn because significant fees are being paid, costs of accommodation and the implications of reduced face-to-face -face contact is diminishing the experience that they get at universities and students are asking these questions about value for money. Can she ensure that the authorities in our universities are doing everything possible to provide that education? Um, can I assure the member that I will continue to engage with the universities around this issue? I am acutely aware that many young people just gone up to university, perhaps for the first time, living on their own, and struck uh, with these kind uh, of uh, situations, will feel lonely and isolated. And I think we need to support our young students through what I think is a very, very difficult time. I am also aware of the issues around uh, the balance between uh, onlining, online learning and face-to-face -face learning. And I think that the universities will have to work very, very hard to get this one right. Obviously, in some courses which have a more practical um, element to their course, the universities will offer more face-to-face -face uh, learning in that course. However, I don't want our young people to have a... Um, poor experience of university. I think for many of us here who were at university, we look back at it with great fondness as a time in our lives as young people were pretty carefree and, and were able to do things. We are in unprecedented circumstances um, and we want to support young people to learn and universities to do the right thing by them. I call Morris Bradley for a question. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, in recent weeks we have heard uh, concerning reports about the spread of COVID across Northern Ireland. What impact would another lockdown have on our economy? Again, um, can I thank the member for his question. It is extremely important. Um, we are very concerned about the transmission and the community transmission um, of COVID um, throughout our communities. And of course, the health um, of our communities and the health of people of Northern Ireland um, is of paramount importance to us. But it is equally important and to say here in this chamber and with great clarity that Northern Ireland simply cannot afford another lockdown. If uh, we think back to the provisions of the schemes in May and our April, March, April, May, and we look at the Chancellor's statement of last week, that will reinforce my view that while we have to look after our health, and that's absolutely vital, we also need to work, learn to work and live and knowing that this virus is in our communities. And the even the fear of another lockdown would impact on business confidence. So therefore, again, I appeal to communities right across Northern Ireland to be careful, to remember social distancing, remember good hand hygiene, look after each other, particularly the older and more vulnerable within our communities, and remember that in order to keep our businesses going, in order to keep jobs and livelihoods in Northern Ireland, we have to do these things. Uh, Morris Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much uh, to the Minister for her answer. Uh, 
Minister, we are faced with the trade-off between health and economic activity, uh, and I fear we will not know the full impact on our economy until the end of the current furlough arrangements. I would urge the Minister to look at innovative ways in which to create job opportunities and employment as we eventually come out of furlough and restrictions, uh, and challenging InvestNI to widen their horizons uh, as, as regards investment across Northern Ireland. Again, um, can I thank the member um, for his uh, question. Um, I am on record um, as saying that um, I think um, that the potential with the furlough scheme ending in October, there is a potential for a further uh, spike in redundancies. Over the last period, we have seen around 9,000 redundancies um, in Northern Ireland, 4,000 of which have already been confirmed. And that situation could uh, get worse. In order to keep our economy functioning, we must keep businesses open. And in order to keep businesses open, we must actually obey the health advice and uh, all of the, the regulations that we do. I am saddened that there are restrictions on the hospitality sector in Northern Ireland. I believe that the hospitality sector has acted uh, responsibly um, and has acted with good faith and interacted uh, with the executive and particularly with me as the Minister of the Economy. Um, and therefore, I want to see those restrictions lessened and lifted as soon as we can. But we all have it in our own power to do that. We need to exercise personal responsibility and uh, obey the regulations. We also need to ensure that our economy and our businesses remain open and that the world knows that Northern Ireland is open for business. And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I was really delighted um, to attend the Irish Open um, at the weekend and to see players from all over the world competing um, in Ballymena um, and to know that that message that Northern Ireland is open for business, can put on these events safely, um, was uh, going right across the world. That's an important message uh, for us to get out um, to potential investors and those who would look to come and visit with us. I call Robin Newton. Deputy Speaker, and the Minister has actually stolen my question because it was around the golf tournament in, in Ballymena. Uh, Minister, uh, Northern Ireland and an essential part of Northern Ireland's economy and a, a growing and significant part of our economy was around the tourism uh, area. And sport has uh, in the past played a great, great uh, part in developing that tourism offering. I wonder if the Minister could address the, the potential for tourism and sport working together for the future in Northern Ireland's economy. I thank the member for his question um, and on talking to uh, members who were there from the European tour in Ballymena, um, in talking to uh, representatives from the Royal and Ancient who were in Ballymena for the Irish Open, I think that there is a really great future for that combination of tourism and sport um, to uh, really excel in Northern Ireland. And I look forward to Northern Ireland hosting more of these really big um, events. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase all that is good about Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, my goodness, I'm sure we all saw that uh, Billy O'Kane's cows um, became a, a, an internet sensation um, uh, during uh, the weekend as well. On a serious note, it is really important that we sustain our tourism and hospitality industries right through this very difficult winter months, and that when we look at 2021, that we will have new opportunities to invest and build on the tremendous work that tourism and hospitality do and the jobs that it provides in Northern Ireland. Very, very brief supplementary, Mr Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the word, words of the, the, the Minister. And perhaps she could just elaborate on maybe a one or two events that you might expect to come on our, our radar for the future. Well, of course, um, um, I have been talking to um, some uh, of those uh, big events. Um, I'm not going to make any announcements uh, today. 
But I think that we have an interest and an exciting pipeline of events that will come to Northern Ireland. And again, I can't resist this, Mr. Speaker, speaking as a, a, an MLA for Upper Ban. I'm also hugely excited uh, by the new Game of Thrones uh, experience um, that will be opening um, in Upper Ban and which has the potential to create jobs and uh, many more tourists um, and, and prosperity. Thank you for that. And that concludes questions to the Minister for the Economy. And if members now just take their ease while we rotate uh, ministers within the chamber. Okay, thank you.